thank you very much, Jatinda Verma from uh, Tara Arts for joining us uh, on this slightly gloomy day up here that we have in Leeds. I don't know what the weather is like down there. Well, it's equally gloomy. Um, <laughs> And you might want to kind of just change that title. Uh, I'm no longer off Tar Arts. I mean, I, I set up a company, but you know, that's that's uh, it's a kind of new new phase now for me. We'll take. Well, that's exactly hopefully what we want to talk about, and uh, we want to talk about that journey and find out exactly what you're up to. Um, I guess the first thing, uh, really. I mean, I'm sure anybody who works in theatre, um, anybody who works in the creative arts, has heard of Tar Arts. Has heard of you and your work. Um, but for those uh, small minority that probably haven't, um, you're a writer, director, uh, you're probably a whole host of other things as well. Tell us a bit about that journey in, in setting up uh, Tara Arts. Uh, what was the environment and the industry like back then and to what extent, this extent has it changed now? Well, we started really, the first production was in 77. The inspiration for it was the unfortunate killing, uh, racist murder, of this young uh, Sikh boy in Southall, Gurdeep Singh Jagar, in uh, July 1976. And rather like the Floyd murder now, uh, it, it, there was a feeling across the country, certainly amongst all Asians, but for the grace of God, they go I. It could have been me. Mm -hmm. And remember, at the time, uh, we did not exist in the public so much. Uh, there wasn't a th issue about Asians. Uh, there was hardly any kind of public awareness. Um, in the arts, uh, you know, you would have plays and events going on, but in the languages, so in Punjabi or Urdu or Gujarati, um, there was no real kind of seizing of the public space. There weren't actors, there weren't writers, or, or, to, or, or of, of a sufficient amount to make a difference. Uh, and so suddenly, when Gurdeep Singh Jagar was killed, one very significant thing happened. And I think that modern Asian history in Britain begins from the streets in Southall. Because what happened in Southall was, for the first time, the public began to realize there is such a thing as young people, young Asians. Mm. And they were shouting. They were shouting that we will not stand for this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not right. Uh, we are here to stay. That was our big cry at the time. We were here to stay. And the streets were seized. Southall became a no-go area for a few days uh, to any non-Asians. Uh, there was demands for justice, demands for uh, uh, equality. Now that was the kind of uh, situation in which we grew up. And as we looked around, we saw that there were very few places where we existed publicly. Uh, things were happening in factories. There were strikes going on, mainly led by Asian women, uh, sporadic strikes like that. Uh, but the public space, which is the theaters, the concert halls, uh, the televisions, uh, those by and large, we did not exist in. And that's really what we started to do, to say that's what we want to do. We will find our public voice uh, and put into that whatever our concerns are. And how hard was that for you? Um, I mean, you mentioned in, 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 that, um, in that answer there about the fact that there was very few uh, artists of sufficient amount. Um, from mine and Sal's perspective, that's probably still true today. Like we, especially in the North, I mean, we really struggle to uh, find a lot of creatives that we, what, that we need for some of our shows, mm -hmm. um, for collaborations, uh, like-minded individuals who are on the same sort of wavelength. Uh, I also think uh, that there's a political climate that's kind of shifted or maybe has stayed the same in which that 
white spaces are still the dominant spaces, uh, even within theatre, and um, it, it takes a lot of courage to um, speak or challenge power, yeah. uh, which I'm, I'm assuming hasn't, hasn't changed much um, since the time that, that Tara originally set up. So how, I mean, how, how difficult has that been to, to be able to find that voice that you, that you... Um, I, I, I think, I think I, uh, of course it's been difficult and I would say it continues to be difficult. And one has to embrace the difficulty because what you're doing, what I certainly felt that we were doing and still feel, is that you were going against the grain. Uh, you were wanting to bring in another, a different kind of story or a different way of working. That's what you wanted to do. And I have to say that, you know, either we were pig-headed, stubborn, uh, uh, or continued to be arrogant, which continues to be today, to say, I know what I'm doing. And it, I'll do it, whatever it takes. So to give you one example, uh, we were clear when we did the first play, which was uh, an adaptation that we did of Rabindranath Tagore's The Sacrifice. And we chose it because this was his protest against the First World War. And he was uh, criticizing an attitude of mind. Now, at the time we felt, of course, uh, there was one kind of attitude of mind which we wanted to challenge, which was racism. Things like what happened to Kuldeep Singh Jagar and so forth. But we also felt that we can't just look outside at society. We've got to look inside as well. So we've got to be just as critical of our own selves. Uh, when it is, if we accept that racism is a form of oppression, then don't assume that we as Asians don't have oppression. Yeah. Uh, whether it is uh, on the basis of gender or caste or creed, you know, we have that as well. It's not the same as racism, that's a different matter, but we do have oppression. So we ought to be critical. Uh, if we're being critical of white society, we ought to be critical of ourselves as well. But having set that out, I mean, we gathered about 50 people from the local community to do that first play. Mm. And absolutely to a person, the vast majority of those 50 people um, were, were not in it for the politics. They felt that we were being political. And we stuck to our guns. And so after that first show, most of them left. There were only five of us left. Yeah. But we carried on <laughs> and that attracted another set of people and then another set of people. Uh, so, I mean, I think that that was one of those moments where, you know, we'd also got money from the community, right? So, so um, there was this thing of, oh God, you're sort of criticizing our parents and so forth. But we felt, no, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, it, it's not a, it's, you know, we're not doing it just for the sake of doing it. The point is that these things need to be talked of and we shouldn't be scared to do it. Racism is not our problem. We mustn't be defined by race. Uh, and so it can be, it can be uh, difficult. And as I say, you know, I think that that difficulty continues right out to today. If you're wanting to say something, there will always be someone who will criticize you. Yeah. Well, really. tough. Just going off the back of that, Jatinda, um, so obviously 1976 was when Nassim Khan's report at the art that Britain ignores uh, was published. Um, what extent do you think the industry still expresses those same kind of feelings and findings even today? Well, I think to some extent, we're, I mean, as it happens, I, I've been kind of reflecting upon that time, obviously, because of what's been going on now. And I think that one big change we can see in the 40 years since Nassim's report and Gurdip Singh's death is that there is a greater degree of representation. Mm. 
you know, you're seeing many more Asian and black actors, um, artists of different kinds uh, on different sorts of stages. There are companies as well. So it's both small scale and large scale. Uh, you're seeing it on the TV, you're seeing newscasters, or all that kind of range of stuff. So there's a greater degree of representation. But can and I- that is a victory of sorts. Just but it seems to me what is missing is equity, mm -hmm. equality. It's not enough to have representation. Uh, who, who controls the, rec, rec, uh, the, the representation? You know, take something like even the funding bodies. The Arts Council is largely a white institution. Uh, it defines who it's giving monies to. And I know, and I know the kind of records show that actually there is a massive disparity between how much is given to so-called BAME artists uh, and how much is given to white artists. Massive disparity. Um, so there are these kind of structural problems which are there. Of course, and there's report after report as well. I'm sure you've read most of them that seem to all be the exact same. <laughs> there's no change in any of that data. But just going back to the point of representation that you made, I mean, they, uh, some of these, these buzzwords, I suppose, in the, in the industry, diversity, representation, equality, um, do you feel that the, uh, the, the guardian, that the, the gatekeepers of, of the industry, the Arts Council and other such institutions truly fully understand these meaning, uh, the, these words? Because is it, is it enough in your opinion, uh, what, does, what does representation truly mean? Does it just mean having black and brown bodies on stage and having black and brown bodies in, on boards and having black and brown bodies in you know, theaters? Or is there, a, is, is there a, another type of meaning to that? Is there a deeper meaning to that? No, I think for the, for the bodies, uh, for institutions like the Arts Council and the BBC and so on and so forth, representation literally means just that. They don't understand. What they don't understand is that one of the consequences of empire is the, that the vast majority of white people in this country of whatever class have inherited a sense of privilege, which we do not have, we, we can't have. Which, it, which is not our inheritance. Privilege, that kind of white privilege, is not our inheritance. And that white privilege goes across the board in whatever field, um, you know, from education right through to housing, it's there. And you can see it very clearly in one aspect of the arts, um, which is education. You look at history, what is being taught? It's from a privileged point of view, not from the point of view of those who were um, subjects of empire. Uh, and hence also things like these statues. You know, currently, if people are going, um, whatever, very agitated about the statues. You have to say, well, don't you understand that your privilege made you absolutely immune to the fact that a slaver uh, or someone who uh, um, championed slavery, uh, you are valorizing, you're putting on a statue. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm aware also that one has to be careful in all of this. Statues is one thing. If we look at this privilege, the biggest arts institution in this country, visual arts institution, is the Tate Gallery. Tate, mm. Sir Henry Tate, was a sugar baron in the West Indies. How did he make his money? Through slavery. Mm. Slaves made his money, which he invested in arts institutions. Mm. Now, is that a question of saying, 
uh, we're going to disband the date? Or is it a question of saying, recognize that that is its origin? Mm -hmm. Once you recognize that, you can then look at, well, is your board, has it got people who can redress some of that balance? Let, and can that then filter into the kinds of artists that are coming in through here? So I guess what you're saying is knowledge building is obviously the most important thing when it comes to, uh, and we would, we would agree with this as well. More than knowledge building, it seems to me it's, it's, a, it's you know, it's not my knowledge in that sense. It's, it's people, if you like, kind of white people recognizing that it's not a question of the guilt of my fathers. It's acknowledging that empire gave you a privilege. Once you acknowledge that, you can then understand why people are angry. Yeah. And then you can join hands with them and say, well, all right, you know, let's, let's figure out what kind of things to change. So you've used the word angry there, which goes nicely to my next question that I wanted to ask, which um, really harks back to uh, a theme that maybe has reoccurred in a lot of Black and Asian work, uh, a lot of work dealing with empire. Do you think being angry is the state that an artist should be uh, to particularly talk about empire uh, and the ramifications of empire and identity? Is that, the, is that the state from which that art exists? Is that the state that maybe some of your art has come from? Um, or is there another way that we can tackle or see empire? Listen, if you're all enjoying the good life, there's no need for art. Art comes about because you rub up against something. There's something you don't like. It could make you angry, it could make you disturbed, it could just make you frustrated. Uh, so I think absolutely, absolutely, all art is fueled by some kind of anger, uh, whether it's an individual artist or whether it's a kind of collective artist, something that makes you rub up against society, something that makes you think, ah, no, that's not right, or I don't like this, so... You know, it, it's, it, it, is, it is a basic condition of being an artist. Mm. So be more angry. And that's a different thing <laughs> from um, when you go into meetings with, I don't know, ministers or arts council boards or whoever else, uh, of wanting to, of then trying to find a way in which you can couch your anger. Uh, because any meeting, it, it doesn't matter which meeting it is. Anger doesn't help because people end up shouting. You want to get the passion across, but you need the arguments to back that up. Mm. Mm. And maybe that, I mean, I suppose maybe that could very well be um, the, the thing for a lot of the stuff that's happening right now with the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff. And the, the, the careful balance that I guess the people who are organizing some of these rallies need to make sure that it doesn't turn into this sort of really angry um, festival of, uh, of, of coming out and, and, and trying to... Uh, sure, but at the same time, see, I wouldn't... I, I, I understand that, but I'll say, I, I also don't underestimate the power of anger, of street action. And that's in the history of the country and the history of every country. Uh, it's when people en masse take to the streets, are angry about something, change occurs. It happened in 76, it happened in 81, it happened in 93. You know, it, it, they're constant things that happen. And in a way, anger becomes that kind of protest uh, large-scale protest, becomes a way in which the powers that be suddenly recognize an issue, as they've done now. Now everyone, from the politicians to the BBC to radio, everyone is talking about Black Lives Matter. And they're talking because people seized the streets, and they were angry enough, and they toppled the statues. Do you think... The question now becomes, what happens next? Mm -hmm. That was what just I was going to ask you is, uh, do you think that this movement, this re this reemergence of the movement, Black Lives Matter, is going to make any kind of real change, or is it going to be one of those, like like it has so many times in the past, uh, emerged, 
a few things have changed, a few things have been done differently, and then it just kind of goes back into the equilibrium. Back to business as usual. Yeah, I think there's some good signs. It's interesting to hear that so many councils in the country are now reviewing the status of their statutes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good sign. I mean, that shows that this has percolated beyond the streets. It's gone into another kind of level. Uh, the, the big question is, how does it percolate into one of the most formative things, which is education, you know, changing the curricula? Uh, will it percolate into things like the BBC, um, wanting to change its leadership? Uh, the Arts Council, change its leadership? The Arts Council used to have a diversity director. It gone. So I, those are the kinds of challenges, I think. And yeah. that's something that's that's really more for us in terms of uh, the, the both the Black Lives Movement, all of us who are involved in the arts, to continue to sort of push for those changes and not not accept with thanks the funding that we get. Mm. It's our right to get funding, absolutely. But I'm not simply going to be thankful for that. Yeah, definitely. There does seem to be this um, almost doting um, kind of mentality within, within the arts of, of trying to um, uh, secure funding. Um, and I guess it is all about resource allocation, isn't it? This is where, going back to your earlier points, it's about uh, who make the decisions, who, who they want to help and who they don't want to help. and then. You know, you and you may get that support until a point that you step out of line, and and then mm -hmm. suddenly that support's gone. Maybe that's how it's always been, and maybe that's how it's all, always will be. I don't know. We'll see. I just wanted to move on to the, this another area. So most of your career, you've obviously spanned. Um, you've sp most of the career that you've had has been with Tara Arts has been to try and nurture this um, this baby that you've that you um, set up, and and then it kind of flourished into all different uh, different things. What have, been your, what have been your, personally, what have been your proudest and greatest and most maybe defining moments and achievements uh, as an individual artist who is at the helm of a company like this, uh, but also achievements of, of the company itself? Well, it's kind of, you know, every project has been, a, has been an achievement from 77 onwards. Um, I, I'd say now uh, that, that building that theatre, the Tara Theatre, for me has been the most, um, I would not say the most satisfying, but that is definitely an achievement. For one reason only, is that for the first time, at least within Asian theatre, there is a bricks and mortar, um, three-dimensional building, a home. And that's really pleasing because our whole history is a very short one. Uh, I mean, nations as a whole. Uh, you know, it only is about 60 years old in, in terms of the mass. And most of that history has been to be tenant. Uh, you know, you're working for someone else or you're actually renting places from someone else. And certainly in the arts, that's what I found, that we were always tenants, you know, begging this theater or that theater to come and do our mm -hmm. work. Finally, we had a building of our own. Yeah. Where you're not the tenant, you're the landlord, if you like. And for me, that's, that's pleasing because because English theatre is defined by its buildings and buildings endure beyond the people and that when I think back to the cry in 1976 you know on the streets of Southall we are here to stay there could be no 
better expression of that than this beautiful building uh, that is open to all kinds of cultures but it is very definitely from an asian point of view mm. and i i and uh, i mean we've not had the we've not had the uh, pleasure of coming down to see the building in real life but um it, it, it looks absolutely exquisite and we have always maintained actually that one of the greatest things that is lacking in this country when it comes to the advancement of black and asian arts or anything that's not uh, you know materially white um is the fact that we have no very few next to no uh, buildings of, of of brick and mortar that we can say that that place is run completely by you know our people it's programmed by our people it's for our communities i mean it's not very fashionable now is it to kind of say that this is uh you know an organization that just makes works for a certain section of people it has to be diverse in every in all forms what's your take on that absolutely i've never had any truck with that because i felt that this is part of diversity mm -hmm. uh, you know and people are hungry for that they are hungry for specific stories and that's what all, all art feeds on it doesn't feed on generalizations it feeds on the very particular which makes people realize ah i have a connection with that or i don't have a connection with it right uh, and that's what all art is about and so absolutely i think that there should be many more many more buildings which are dedicated to asian arts or black arts absolutely uh, and they add to the whole ecology of theater and the arts in this country they do not detract from it if you look at the ecology of the arts you can't say it's homogenous there are small houses there are larger houses some do opera some do musicals some do new plays that's the variety art has always fed on diversity mm -hmm. this to me seems to be part of that diversity what's your take on uh, political blackness and to what extent have you applied it to tara arts and maybe to your own work as an artist uh, and do you think it's still relevant now perhaps more relevant now um, i've always felt that blackness that's our kind of political well that's our existence in this country um, I think one of the biggest fault lines in this country, apart from religion, Catholic or Protestant, now since the Second World War, it's color. And color is very rarely recognized as such. You know, now it's come back onto the fore with Black Lives Matter. But you know, we see it in all these terms that the Arts Council and local authorities went through. You know, you say diverse because you don't want to say black. You don't. You don't want to talk about color uh, because it's too uncomfortable. But color is the big, big, big kind of dividing line, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and it and that's for both of us that we both have to come to terms with it because it also changes the the idea of England. You know, the idea of England within a certain kind of color palette is white mm. how do you how do you put another idea in and that's what seems to me is what our efforts are all about is that we are trying to reclaim another kind of color mm. there is this idea that diversity even i mean there seems to be a, very, um, a history to the word diversity itself it obviously once was used to uh, describe um race and, and color maybe more so than it does now uh, now it does include a lot of a lot of different uh, sections which is in line with obviously the um the legal acts but do you think the word diversity has any kind of political usage or political um any kind of political credence for white people to be used so that they feel like they can also be part of that conversation Yes, there's a kind of an element of that, but I think evasiveness doesn't help anyone. 
The point is that if you are from Poland, from Spain, from France, uh, from Sweden, and you come and live in this country, while there will be some bit of sort of rubbing against you, the point is that color allows you to slide, to slip in. If you come in from the Caribbean or from Africa or from Asia, there is no level at which you can slide in straight away. Mm. At the very border, you stand out. That's the first start. At the very border, you stand out. If you've been living here for generations, the color makes you stand out. Where are you from? Where were you born? What's your background? Those are facts, which, you know, I don't, I don't mourn because that's part of me, but that is a fact. Mm. And that's where I think that uh, diversity is often being used by the people in power to evade the central question. Because really it is with the color question that you see most sharply the uh, uh, disparities uh, in, uh, in funding or in housing and so on and so forth within the society at their sharpest. That can then help you also see the disparities in terms of uh, ability, disability, in terms of religion, so on, so on, so on and so forth. Yeah, definitely. And I totally agree with that. And I think um, that there just need to be, there needs to maybe be a bit of um, consideration as to how some of these ter terms have changed meaning, because I think it does, it can happen so like a sleight of hand and it, it changes the way we make our work, doesn't it? It changes the way we understand, uh, even as black and Asian artists, it changes the way that we respond to that um, and, and how, we, how white people, the relationship that white people have with us and our work. Mm -hmm. Um, I think even within our own communities as well, because obviously the political blackness, it had a very different meaning uh, in the 70s, uh, as we we're speaking about the, the, the riots that existed and it, that happened in London and nationwide. And there was um, groups like the United Black Youth League, which was mainly South Asian and Afro-Caribbean. But there's also, um, I think we need to also acknowledge that because it's been so long since that term has been used and now it's come back into power again, it means very different things for, you know, for various communities, especially with yep. the the influence of the Af African-American um, politics that's seeping over into England have got a very different understanding of the word black. Yeah. Um, and also that, you know, obviously we have to recognize that within our own communities, uh, which is both black and Asian, mm -hmm. we have all sorts of attitudes about each other, which again are kind of rooted in empire, you know, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, because it was Indians who actually ended up taking the place of the slaves. They ended up becoming the new slaves. Now, how much are we aware of that? That there was a new form of slavery that was also introduced. It shoved people into the Caribbean, into Africa, and into Fiji. But it had a consequence, because for those people who'd, who'd won their emancipation, they saw these Indians come in and take over their jobs but, but as slaves. And of course, they disparage them, hence the word coolie, uh, which was a technical term anyway. But in a way, we've also got to look at that. It, this is just between ourselves or, or internally to say that there has been kinds of linkages that came about because of the imperial past, which is a shared past. So given, given, given all of that, what next? What's next for Jatinder? Um, have, you, have you left Harach yet? Are you, are you outgoing? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have left, uh, or I, uh, certainly at the end of this month, I absolutely uh, completely <laughs> kind of cut off. But, you know, I've got, well, I've set up my own company, which is JV Productions, and I'm carrying on. So <clears throat> uh, I've got a couple of projects. One is looking at Hiroshima, because there's the 75th anniversary of uh, the the atomic bomb this year, which still seems the most sort of incredible thing to have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also looking at the only play that was banned by the British. So it's the first play and that introduced censorship into India. And it was about uh, farmers making indigo dye, which is what is used in genes. Um, 
I mean, both productions, of course, have had to <laughs> be parked to, to, to next year. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of looking at ways in which those could be redone uh, or, or presented in this other format, which is an online format, um, while we wait on the production to occur next year. Uh, so I'm currently kind of trying to furiously teach myself how to film and how to edit. Right? <laughs> which is exactly what we've been doing as well. Yeah, which is great. I mean, I think it's fantastic. You know, it's not too late. Great learning all these new skills. Um, and I'm kind of looking at um, you know, one of my abiding interests has been the Mahabharata because it's the only text I know of in world literature which is about a family splitting apart. And it seems to me that that's what's happening in the country. Brexit has made us into two very different branches of the same family. Um, so I've been kind of looking at that and the stories within that to see, yeah, are there ways in which to adapt this, to rework this kind of model? Um, and I'm also working with a young researcher uh, who has got very interested in the story of Gurdjieff Singh Chagar. Uh, so fortunately, she's been assembling uh, the, the, the material and I've had a kind of look at the material uh, and I'm now working with her to think of different ways in which that material can, can come out uh, until such time when we can make a production of it. Because uh, mm. I think that that, it's an important story. Uh, and for me, one of the most moving things about that story is that, uh, aside from the fact that uh, he was only 17 and he was killed in a part of London which was safe. You know, it was known as Little India even then. Mm -hmm. um, but two weeks before he was killed, he cut off his hair. He was a sick in order to fit in. Mm -hmm. And then he gets killed. It's interesting, you've, uh, it's, it's almost like you've come back full circle. Um, at the end of your tenure at, at Tara and, and looking at the story um, that inspired you originally to say that it originally yeah. inspired you I think there seems, there seems to be something very poetic about that mm -hmm. uh, not to say that that's the <laughs> <your> final thing <laughs> no, no, no. but it's great I mean you know that's partly, partly what happens uh, when you're in the in, in, in the arts or certainly in the theatre for as long as I've been that there are certain things that sort of keep coming back mm. uh, it could be certain texts or certain just ways of looking uh, that you find yourself, yes, I, I'm kind of repeating, but hopefully it's not repeating in the same way. You know, hopefully I've learned a little bit in yeah. all these years. Out of interest, was there a production or some kind of play or something that came out of when you originally set up the company, out of that whole struggle of that, and that murder? Did, did, was, did no, no. Uh, it was too fresh at the time. Uh, and so we never quite sort of touched, we, we fed it in through the adaptations and stuff, uh, but never quite looked at that incident itself. Uh, mm. So I was delighted when I came across this research and she, out of her own uh, desire, uh, had started researching and trying to find out about uh, this particular fellow. Yeah, because there's, there's very little about him, there's very little out there about him actually. Uh, weirdly enough, in archives and stuff. I mean, we've looked, we've looked ourselves, and uh, there wasn't, there wasn't much. Well, there wasn't so we'd much be, yeah, yeah we'd be really interested to. to, yeah. to be there. Mm. And in terms of your, 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 your art, your work, the thing that you want to focus on now after Tara, is it writing? Is it directing? What is it? What is your passion? I mean, not to say that you have to be exclusively one or the other, but what is it that you really like doing? Yeah, I think one of the things that both stepping back from Tara and the lockdown has, has sort of made clear in me is that I miss directing. That, that thing of working with people to shape something, that's really what's, what's my sort of biggest buzz. Uh, and yes, I mean, you know, the writing is, is fine, but it hasn't, I know that I am not, uh, I'm not that kind of a writer. Uh, I can edit, I can adapt, but I'm not that kind of a writer. I leave that to others. Mm. Uh, I used to, when we started, think that I was an actor. 
big, big black one. I didn't know you had that feather in your cap. That would be interesting to see what. Uh... Oh, uh, I had, I had, uh, I had quite a few uh, of uh, <laughs> plays which I acted in. But no, you, you know, one, you, you sort of learn over the years to take your art seriously, mm-hmm. and part of taking it seriously is to then uh, be more discriminating about yourself to say well all right you know know where your talent is and mm. that ain't it absolutely and i think uh, that is a is a very good note to maybe uh, draw draw this to a close we need to be more courageous and we need to continue making art especially under these times and uh, we can't wait until tara opens up again so we can finally get the opportunity to come down and see it but also to meet yourself uh, in, in face to face and maybe do another interview about the production that you're, you're going to go and do. Um, but Jacinda Verma, thank you so much for taking thank time you. out uh, for speaking to us.